uh, let's uh, go into the substance Bef before we dive in into the anything uh, of uh, uh, like content or other things you guys should have seen the outline that uh, that I sent out I will be sending out this type of outlines uh, in uh, uh, th th throughout the uh, preparation and uh, uh, those outlines will be complementary to the preparation material that I either sent out or will be sending out to making it available online. So, so that's the deal. Also, um, uh, so go, go, going, going, and I think this is very important because we once in a while we do have individuals who are eligible, almost eligible, and. Uh, so, so, so I think every time I, I, I do come across some individuals who are very smart people, but f for one reason or another, they're not qualified. Uh, just by way of example, I had this uh, chat with uh, a clerk of court who works for the judge, and uh, I uh, did my time at the court. Uh, doing uh, the court stuff. My, uh, I, I still go to court sometimes in, as an attorney, but basically we just went to the Starbucks. That was before COVID. And uh, uh, the gentleman was really interested in taking the uh, customs license broker exam. So my, my next question was, okay, so are you able to see it? And the answer was, it depends. In that situation, the clerk was working for the federal court. And because he was working for the federal court, he was considered to be the employee of the United States or the federal government, that, that bullet point three that uh, uh, I'm, uh, I, I put on the screen. Now, uh, had I had a conversation with a gentleman who was working for New York State Court, for example, that would be that would have been a different story. So it's it's very important to uh, to, to to know where you're at, for example. And uh, in the in the case of of the clerk uh, with whom I, I spoke, some of some of you may know that the way the system works is uh, you once you graduate from law school one of the career paths you may choose is go work for the judge as a clerk and usually this is a point this is one or two year job and then you move on you you go into the private sector private law firm so uh, in the in the situation as such you know if you uh, two year term or one year term or whatever it is coming up uh, you may as well start preparing same thing for the 18 year olds with citizens, it's a different story. So, uh, if you're a green card holder or you have LPR or lawful permanent resident status, that, of course, may be a different story because uh, qualification, by the time you come to the exam, as, you, as, as we shall see, we'll be going uh, over notice of examination in a bit. Uh, what, what you'll be finding is you'll be finding that the, you will not, they will not let you in unless you have those papers that show that you are a U.S. citizen. So, for example, certificate of naturalization would be one of them. So, uh, I have met people who were not citizens at the time of preparing for the exam, but they were so sure that they're going to get their citizenship, they decided to start preparing anyway. Uh, the way the immigration works. Uh, well, in fact, th there were some slowdowns, but uh, uh, from uh, speaking to my immigration colleagues, I know some. So in some ways they even became more efficient, whether they're working from home or they're managing the caseload because a lot of stuff came uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the electronic world. Uh, uh, so cases move faster, but nevertheless, uh, the USCIS or Immigration uh, uh, Service, uh, they, they do tend to uh, take their time. Uh, 
so it's it's a risky thing if you are an immigrant and uh, or lawful permanent resident status and um, uh, expecting your citizenship and by the time you hit that examination uh, timeline you haven't been granted your status all right so so those are the basics uh, the fourth one is 390 it used to be much lower uh, but uh, now it's it's 390 uh, and it is uh, being uh, re required to be paid online all right so so those are the basics if you guys are uh, have met those basics uh, welcome uh, if you think for some reason you're not qualified or whatever please talk to me because uh, I don't want you to waste your time sitting. I, I, I even remember at least another story. There was a gentleman, he would come to the class, and that was before COVID, so he would come to the class uh, wearing the United States Postal Service uniform. So obviously that was a sign that uh, there was questions with eligibility. So uh, <laughs> uh, if, if you work for USPS, uh, uh, United States Postal Service that is considered to be federal government. So uh, for that purposes, this is something which you need to be mindful. All right. Uh, so uh, exam frequency every fourth Wednesday of uh, April and October. So this one uh, is a kickoff for April. Uh, notice uh, every fourth Wednesday for April or, or October. And uh, this is the key because we come across uh, various uh, notices and uh, regulations which may not coincide to what exactly is written in the regulation. And the good example of that is specifically what we just talked about, the fourth Wednesday of April or October. So let's take a look at the, uh, the notice of examination. Oh, uh, folks, by the way, what what I learned, so basically the way the presentation will go, so we do have the outline, right? The, so the, the, the outline which I sent out, and I also rely a lot of, uh, well, very often on the internet resources because they are contemporaneous, they can be uh, they're updated all the time, um, and uh, in, in, in this situation, for example, if you look at the screen, you, you, you will be able to see that you have already the date set for the, for the next exam. Uh, that was not the case just a just few days ago. So keep in mind uh, that I'll be relying on various links, uh, customs links, other links. Uh, so uh, th throughout, th throughout, oh, okay. Okay, going going back to the uh, to the chat. So the question is, uh, what about the teachers of public schools? So uh, the, uh, I'm I live in New York, and uh, New York uh, City public schools are managed by the New York City Department of Education. This is the city uh, government. This is not the federal government. Uh, and the idea here is uh, you are not working for the federal government. Of course, if you are on a military base, let's say uh, you are somewhere in Guam, uh, and uh, or, or or outside, and you have your kids going to the uh, to, to the public school uh, on the base, uh, well, public servicemen and women. Uh, that would that could be a different story because you are in the payroll of the federal government. So so basically, uh, that would be uh, the situation with with teachers. It it it, it really depends. And uh, to to drive the point home, I think it would be very helpful to uh, actually take a look at the law itself because the law. Uh, and, and by law here we're talking about the examination does list the basic requirements so if you look at uh, requ requirements what we just talked about we talked about the uh, section 111.13 and by the time uh, we 
will get towards the examination, you'll be probably remembering all those uh, regulations just like that. But for now, once we get to that uh, 111.13, which is the section of the Code of Federal Regulation that does administer uh, the qualification and the purposes, etc., you will see that employee of the United States government is, uh, or rather, not an officer or an employee of the United States government, is one of the prerequisites. Of course, uh, then we get to the question of wh who is an employee or what's an em what does an employee mean? Because uh, in a modern world of uh, outsourcing, of uh, having independent contractors for hire, uh, you, especially in logistics and transportation sector, you do have a situation where that line gets blurry because independent contractor is technically is not employee, he is the uh, sole proprietor in a way or independent. So he is treated differently. Uh, that issue did come up several times. I think it came up with uh, the relationship with other relationships uh, such as uh, representing uh, uh, customs license broker, a relationship between the broker and the forwarder, uh, and relationship within the company itself. Uh, we'll be covering that under the customs uh, license customs broker responsibility section. Uh, but uh, that um, relationship was basically defaulted to the common law definition of employer-employee. So they do defer that and it's case-by-case -case basis. All right. Uh, so uh, going uh, to the... Well, actually, we're good because we are on the regulation and we can see that uh, the administration of the exam is is in the regulation is prescri prescribed every f on the fourth Wednesday in April and October. Okay, unless there is a national holiday, relig religious observance, or foreseeable event, blah blah blah. All right, so fourth Wednesday. If you if you guys are going and uh, open up the calendar, let's say. And I'm just going to open any calendar for 2021, all right? So this is 2021. Uh, we see that April, the Wednesday number one, Wednesday number two, Wednesday number three, and Wednesday number four, right? So the regulations do say it, this is done on the fourth Wednesday, right? which, uh, logically speaking, is 28th, which is a Wednesday number 4. But uh, let's go to the notice of examination. So this is cbp.gov. Uh, if you can see, the, the, you, you have explicit statement that says April 21st, 2021. If you do go back to the calendar and you check the, the, the calendar again, you can see that the Wednesday of 21st of April is the third Wednesday, not the fourth Wednesday. So welcome to the world of customs. <laughs> That's uh, 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 the, the first interpretative puzzle uh, that we come across because obviously regulations say one thing, but uh, the notice of examination says another thing. For you guys, that means, and it may be updated later on, but for you guys, what it means is that uh, you guys have less time to prepare and uh, you have to work a little bit harder. All right, so uh, going back uh, to, the, to the board, Customs Broker License Examination Notice. So this time we're very fortunate because we were able to get this notice early out. And uh, the reason we are fortunate is uh, very often when uh, we do start these classes, we simply 
we can guess, but we are not very certain about what type of books are we going to get. What what date, uh, uh, for example, are they going to use this year's version of CFR, the previous version of the CFR? Are they going to use the harmonized tariff schedule, which is uh, version numbers some like 3.0 as opposed to the uh, original one? This time we do know thanks to that notice. So that means that uh, we uh, can roll up our sleeves and not waste any time and get the stuff. Uh, we also know that so so that's uh, uh, that that goes to the CBLE material, right? CBLE reference material that are posted out there. Now, uh, exam registration. So if you if you do click on the link, uh, you will let's in fact let's do that right now. Let me see if I can speed it up. All right, so hmm, okay, here. Uh, so for brokers, uh, you will need to create an account. So we have two items right now. The, the one, one is triennial, uh, which means that uh, every year the licensed customs broker must register uh, with customs. So this is the third year. And this is something which uh, appears on the test a lot. Okay, just a second. Hello, Yuri speaking. Yes, hi. Is this Yuri? Yeah, this is Kim. Yeah, hi, Yuri. This is Katia. I am trying to connect. I am. I think I am on the Vimeo. But yeah. Nobody is speaking. Is that? Do I have to do something else? Okay, hold on a second. Uh, so uh, everyone who c who can see this, uh, all my stats show that uh, you guys are able to log in. Uh, let me see. Uh, did you, uh, Katya, did you use the link that I gave you? Yes, and then I click on the, um, I, and then I enter the code. And I can see U.S. Customs Broker, License Exam. Mm -hmm. And on the chat I put, hi. Oh, so hold on a second. So, okay, I see you. I see you right there. So, so you did say hi. So, so you were able to get in. Yes, but I don't listen anything or everything. Nothing is happening. Oh, you cannot hear my voice. Mm -mm. No. Hmm. Uh, my stats show that I do have uh, the voice. Uh, can you hit uh, like a reload button? Uh, yeah, uh, you know what? I, I have a headphone on me. Mm -hmm. but, but I cannot hear anything on the class. Mm -hmm. Hold on a second. So you have a headphones. Uh, maybe uh, you were able to hear me before, right? Okay, because I have folks here uh, saying that uh, everyone can hear me. Well, at least some of, some can hear me. Can you check your computer? Maybe it's your computer. Like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll try again, okay? And uh, let you know. Uh, uh, Bye-bye. Yeah, try again. If not, try to use your f cell phone. Okay. And if you, can, if you can't do that, can you at least see me on the screen? Yeah, no. Okay, if you... If, what, here's what we're going to do. Uh, if you still can't fix that, call me back. I'll just put you on mute so that way you'll be able to hear me f through the phone. Okay. Is that I a deal? No, no. It, uh, like, like I said, issues happen all the time and uh, we just have to deal with it one step at a time. Sooner or later, okay. we'll fix it up. Yeah. All right, so give me a call back uh, and tell me what's going on if you can't uh, do that. Yeah, I do that then. Okay. Okay, what, what, so... Uh, so, one, one of the things uh, which I find 
interesting um, is uh, um, the te technological advances. One of the reasons I stuck I stuck to the Vimeo platform was uh, because, for example, I'm able to uh, switch those screens. So, uh, for example, let me uh, just uh, for example, this is uh, I, I if I if something I need sometimes I just need to get up and I need to do the presentation here. I need to uh, point uh, the finger. So I I do have this ability to switch between cameras. So I have one camera set up here, another camera set up there. Then this whole screen can be a camera. So this is one of the advantages which I, I really like that Vimeo allows me something that I cannot do on Zoom. On Zoom, I was also limited to the to the to the stream bandwidth, which uh, limited me to something like 720p. And since we deal with a lot of text, this is just not good enough because you guys need uh, you need to see you need to be able to read it. You know, like like whatever I put on the screen, it needs to be legible. Um, and since many people use uh, smartphones to uh, to, to view the stuff, it becomes ever more important. So, so that's that, that's why I stuck to this. But uh, notwithstanding, we still have issues. So, so let's just deal with this one step at a time. Okay. So, uh, going back to where we were, registration. Okay. So, uh, registration is done through there. Uh, we do have dates. And the dates are uh, mark your calendar February 16th, 2021. All right, I'll be uh, sending the reminder, so it's uh, more than a month from now. Uh, but uh, what we do have is we do have the, the the date when you can register, and the registration itself gets you your place, gets you your uh, beautiful seat on the exam uh, examination site. The assignment of the examination site according to the notice, is uh, done as a second step. That was not the case before. Uh, be uh, before, Customs and Border Protection as an agency were directly responsible for the exam administration. So what would happen is they would rent out the hotel uh, ballroom and they would just uh, bring people in and there were actual officers with the badges administering. Uh, now, following the common trend of outsourcing, uh, they outsourced uh, this stuff to the third party. And that third party is uh, uh, Pearson something incorporated. Pearson View... I don't think I have their exact legal name, uh, but nevertheless, they're 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 on on site, so they have uh, proctors or uh, the uh, exam administrators, uh, TAs, test administrators, sometimes what they call themselves, and uh, those test administrators uh, and the exam itself, uh, they do have the procedure uh, the the procedure. Uh, hold on a second. Let me follow up with uh, Katrina to see if she is able to hear. All right. Uh, so, so the the site selection would come next, and this brings a little bit of anxiety because uh, you are able to select your site, and they say, "Well, if you, uh, we don't guarantee you." So, uh, it kind of implies, "Hey, we are." not guaranteeing you because it's on first come first serve basis so you did make your reservation before it was your reservation was uh, uh, you got your seat and you got uh, your assignment now let's say you according to the notice they are saying listen if you are able to uh, oh great <laughs> Katrina welcome uh, see uh, the audio magic stuff all right uh, and by the way, this audio stuff is not new. I, I uh, do plan to, uh, we'll see how it goes, but I uh, 
uh, do plan to bring some of my colleagues as guest speakers uh, for uh, for the class uh, because they tend to bring different perspective and uh, uh, some of the colleagues uh, that I do bring, that I do invite, of course, uh, I it, try to invite them remotely. And with one of them, I literally uh, cannot, uh, I, uh, with anyone I can solve audio problem, but with this gentleman. So I literally have to have one of those uh, microphones connected to the phone, uh, turn the speaker on, and that way we were able to communicate. So uh, kind of like a combination of old school uh, versus uh, modern technology. So site selection is a uh, is a second step. Uh, the best thing to do is uh, check your email often and uh, be on the lookout. So that's for the site selection. All right, now let's get to the good stuff. The good stuff includes uh, the materials that have been already published. All right, so very very important uh, when you show up at the exam uh, yes they do say that uh, they started to provide you with reference material they do say that uh, you can use uh, their search functions I have not heard too much uh, good feedback about it at least from the people with whom I spoke so uh, it doesn't hurt to have a backup uh, moreover, it would be very much useful to be able to use your own stuff because that way you're touching it, you're working on it. As you work your, throughout the exam and prepare, you're making notes. And we'll go over the details of my suggestions in a bit. But basically, the idea here is you have your stuff and you know them like your, your own hand because you know exactly what's going on. So, so this is a very important part of preparation and the materials start there. Another important part of preparation is you come with your own stuff. Uh, you also uh, need to have a plan. We'll talk about how I would recommend to have a plan. Uh, but uh, this requires you, number one, not only to, to bring your own material, which is prepared, marked, and annotated. But it also requires you to be, to be, to be able to uh, quickly dive into the questions, ask, uh, look at the procedure or protocol of the exam, which is all available, and have your mind focused on the questions themselves, not the procedural miscellaneous stuff like I agree, or I do not agree or, 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 or all other stuff. So uh, procedure is very important because what I've noticed uh, from the past, the Pearson, Pearson uh, are the folks who run, uh, who, who run the administration of the customs uh, broker exam, but uh, they do run a webinar, like a two hour webinar right before uh, the exam and most of the stuff they talk about is the procedure. I was uh, so I was I attended one uh, last September I think they w w when they were administering the exam for October and I was so many so much surprised by how many questions were being asked about the features that were could have been easily checked at uh, you at your computer before right before you. And this is extremely important to feel comfortable with the uh, with the navigation buttons, uh, with uh, the procedural miscellaneous stuff, which is not that important. So it's very it's extremely important for you to come in focused on the exam questions themselves, so that way you don't waste any time. Uh, because a lot of the stuff is not really testing how smart you are. Uh, uh, this is really a, a race against time and this is about your time management skills. And if you don't feel comfortable with the procedure, that can really hurt you, even though you may know the, all the answers or most of the answers. So, so this is, this is uh, the key. Uh, so uh, as, 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 as mentioned earlier, the key here is to prepare 
uh, your own stuff. I uh, so CVP examiners did publish what they expect you to know, and this is important uh, from the substantive perspective as well. Because, for example, we do know that we we'll, they going to test you on April 2020. Uh, code of Federal Regulations. So for me, this is a sign that I'm not going to spend too much time on North America Free Trade Agreement because uh, North America Free Trade Agreement uh, got its headway in uh, July on July 1st. But at the same at the same time, I'm not going to spend too much time on. Uh, Canada, uh, Mexico, United States free trade agreement, the successor free trade agreement, because they are not in the regulations. Uh, so that, that stuff did not become the law yet. So it's kind of like in the warp. Although technically, uh, NAFTA stuff are in, uh, if they're going to test you on this uh, Code of Federal Regulations, uh, part 181 NAFTA is still uh, good at least uh, at the time of the publication of the Code of Federal Regulations. So this means that uh, uh, some time should be spent on it. And the way uh, we'll, we'll do it is, instead of talking through this stuff, I'll just make an assignment because I covered this uh, extensively uh, in the previous uh, preparation courses. So I'll just have you view the playback. So that's why it's important. Uh, uh, not only from your guys' perspective, but also from mine to structure the course. All right. Now, uh, going to the exam materials. All right. So I posted, uh, uh, notice the link. And so everyone is on the same page. I'm going to uh, put it in the chat too, uh, because I just updated the stuff. Uh, the stuff which uh, have been updated with the links does include the HTS, the Title 19 the, uh, of the CFR, which you need to have, uh, the and miscellaneous stuff, right? The instructions uh, for the entry summary, directives, and uh, ACE, ACE stuff. So let's uh, spend a little bit time on that because we need to know how we should uh, prepare. So one of the things that we need uh, uh, to be mindful of is there is this modern world wor wor word in the modern world. Uh, I think it's called agronomics. And agronomics is basically uh, being comfortable with uh, having stuff, uh, what you, the controlling stuff, and uh, making sure that you are well settled uh, to do the job you want to do. So one of the agronomic stuff, if we go to the Pearson and uh, the C CBP uh, websites, uh, we will kind of get a sneak preview of what the room looks like let me see if i can make it a little bit more visible so so this is this is what you're going to expect so custom designers were nice enough to provide uh this type of um pleasant atmosphere uh and uh so uh you you have your own cubicle basically the cubicle is not large but uh, it gives you the sense of what you can do as far as arrangement is concerned. And at this point of time, once you see that picture, it's time for you guys to start planning. All right. What does it mean? That means that... Uh, you, take a look at the picture. Let me uh, increase it a little bit. All right. So over here, you can see the books uh, which are on the table. So this is uh, something which I would, the type, the, the type of books which I would not really recommend. So uh, right, 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 
there, you, you can see that they have three CFR books. Those type of books, if you go to the, uh, the GPO, Government Printing Office Store, so you go to gpo.gov and you order books from them, this is the stuff you're going to get. Not good. Number one is because it's the small little version. You need to have a lot of side notes to write on. So 8.5 by 11 is the best uh, stuff that you can have. And this stuff is not only uh, free PDF version that uh, I, I made available through the link, but it also, let's say you mess something up and you need to tear, tear, tear the page out and rewrite it. You can just print out the page and stick it in. Here, you kind of stuck with what you have, number one. And number two, you're not saving too much money on this one. Uh, another thing that I want you to notice is uh, this particular, uh, this is uh, looks like HTS book. So HTS book does uh, 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 look like it is on a rack. And uh, whatever they promote as far as a, a rack version is concerned uh, is uh, co coincided with various inserts with about one inch ring binders, uh, which are uh, hanged on, 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 on the brackets, or one, one among the other. When I was doing entries as a licensed customs broker, as a broker for the forwarders, I found this kind of comfortable uh, uh, and nice to use, but, uh, and, it seems like customs examiners do encourage to, to, to use this because obviously they, they put it put it out as an example. But here is a catch though. Will you able to uh, will, will, will you able to use it in such a way where it's it's convenient for you, meaning like you have to roll out, roll back in, uh, so what I'm getting to, what I'm getting to is that if back in the day when I took it and my, my customs license broker, broker exam was way before this electronic stuff. So we used to have the six inch table, uh, six feet table. I'm sorry, those, those regular picnic tables. And, um, I would, I, I just brought regular binders. And I'll talk about the binders that I would recommend in a bit, but I brought just regular binders and I would have HTS binders on the bottom, CFR on top and vice versa. And uh, switch them around without even moving my butt back and forth. Uh, simple, within the reach, efficient. And if you have your stuff paginated, tabulated, marked, you again, you save precious time, and the idea here is to save uh, to save your time on the miscellaneous organizational stuff, so you can focus on the substance. So, uh, going back to the uh, to, to to the uh, examination, uh, to, to the examination uh, picture. Uh, which is, uh, let me see, here, the, the HTS. So, so this is another picture that they provided. And they say, okay, you guys can use the stand. Uh, and you saw that previously from this picture because this is the stand they have. Okay. So I checked that stand. It's, it is on Amazon. This is something that they promote. I do not know if these guys are uh, have a stake in the outcome or anything. But uh, pretty much they say, okay, so if you bring this up and this is what it looks like, uh, you're good. <laughs> but notice, look at the dimensions. 16.5, 15.5, and 38. Uh, so let's go to the customs... Uh, uh, to that Pearson uh, overview of regulations and uh, the rules. And here's what they say. Uh, you br you're allowed to bring one rolling crate not to exceed 16 
by 18.5 by 15 inches uh, in uh, volume, right? So uh, if you go back to the Amazon page, at least according to this description, you have the 39 inch uh, height. <laughs> so, uh, so on one hand, examiners do say that uh, you, you're welcome to uh, bring this stuff in. On the other hand, they say, well, if you bring this type of, of voluminous uh, uh, item, then we have a right to exclude you. So what do you do? Well, uh, notice that they talk about, if, if, you, if you look at the notice, you, it talks about the rolling rate, such as the one they just showed, or uh, the suitcase, right? So, if, in other words, if you are uh, not bringing either rolling crate or the suitcase, so I remember when, when I came in to the exam, I just uh, had something like a bunch, bunch of binders. So, I, I uh, my, mine was in Miami. Uh, I was living in Miami, Seaport at that time. So, they made everyone drop the backpacks in the corner and bring all the stuff. So, I would take out all my binders, put them on the table. I think I made several trips and then left my backpack in a corner where everything was dumped without uh, without issues. So, uh, so, so pretty much, yes, the rule says this. The recommendations do kind of contradict the volume because on one hand they say you can bring that crate but the crate does exceed the dimensions they recommend. So, uh, we so far just encountered the second contradiction, which talks about the volume. The recommended volume exceeds the volume that is stated in the rules. The first contradiction being the fourth day of the, uh, of, of fourth Wednesday of the, of the month. So, uh, these contradictions will continue to mount, and uh, this is another important hint for you guys uh, to keep in mind. Please try not to think in terms of black and white very often. It's, it would be helpful to think of uh, this, this uh, particular exam just like the real world, because it, it, the real world consists of a lot of gray, mushy, ushy stuff, right? And there is a lot of uncertainty, depending on the, the way you look at it. Is the glass half empty or the glass half full? Uh, same, same situation here. Uh, this stuff is written by people. The regulations are written by people. People make mistakes. It's, it's just common common thing they do. So. That means that uh, you are bound to, make, to have contradictions, even uh, uh, if the statement was, was made in a well meaningful way. Uh, if some of you check out uh, some of uh, my other stuff on the website, you may know that I uh, do, once in a while, I do appeals. I appeal in customs license broker exam and um, I haven't done much I've done like uh, because I, I just simply run out of time but I did like 20 qu review 20 questions on one exam and 20 questions on another exam on each side I, I found like four appealable uh, issues that can be brought up to the attention of customs as, as by way of appeal simply because the way the question was written uh, left a lot of that mushy mushy gray stuff so uh, so uh, don't don't go crazy if something is not logical uh, but uh, just try to establish the tendencies there was a uh, this uh, person who, um, uh, who, who who I think is a uh, is an individual who who's who, uh, who, who, who I like to read about. So his name is Alan Dallas. Uh, Alan Dallas, uh, he uh, was a founder of uh, what's called modern CIA, uh, Central Intelligence Agency, and he used to have this phrase, uh, 
and uh, it's it's not literal but the point of it is was it's very easy to confuse people with facts but if they understand the tendencies uh, you uh, you you cannot confuse them they know what's going on so uh, one of the ideas here is to really understand the general tendencies of where we're going to uh, what the laws are meant to uh, to, and by laws, I'm talking about the uh, customs laws here, the regulations, what the laws are meant to uh, establish and to protect. And uh, that can be helpful in figuring out the right answers. All right. So, uh, going back to, to our board. We have this material uh, the links are provided there so uh, you, once you have this material if you click on the link you have the HTS full document can be downloaded over here this is a this is a uh, the uh, basic 2020 edition of the HTS US which CBP examiners will be testing you uh, if you bring the later or the uh, earlier versions, you are risking to be uh, to be a disadvantage because one of the things about HTS and the one that gives me a lot of uh, grief uh, because I prepare uh, books and I prepare classes is the numbers change all the time, and when the numbers change, the you bring, you come with the old HTS and the harmonized tariff number, uh, which is uh, the classification number. Uh, that number is different; it's nowhere to be find, found, and uh, you're looking for it and it's not there. And then you can make an approximation at uh, the heading level. Uh, I'll be talking about this classification details later on, but basically, the a harmonized tariff schedule changes. So. Uh, going back to the stuff, the customs, bro customs broker license exam, of course, is designed your knowledge to test your knowledge of customs laws. Uh, customs laws, uh, in particular, as far as customs business is concerned, uh, has to deal with two main bodies: harmonized tariff schedule, which uh, is uh, designed to determine the uh, the product. Uh, its duty rate and uh, uh, various other provisions such as uh, the country of origin uh, you know we're talking about the tariff shifting uh, and, and other things so that's number one so you have HTS US uh, number two you have the Code of Federal Regulation, and this is a Title 19. So HTS US plus co CFR, Code of Federal Regulations. And we're talking about the Title 19 uh, because uh, usually every agency, every administrative agency is getting the stuff assigned uh, uh, their own title. So uh, in case of customs, it's just Title 19. That's FDA, for example, Food and Drug Administration is Title 21. So, uh, and they do find overlap, you know where, uh, because you maybe get to be tested on Title 21, uh, and this is done through A stuff. Uh, because sometimes uh, the other agencies they uh, creep their way into the world of customs broker examination through this miscellaneous provisions. All right, so those are the, but basically when it comes down to the study, those are the two main bodies, and they do interact. So one is uh, you cannot treat one mutually exclusive uh, of of another. We'll be talking about uh, how to read this one and how to read this one. Uh, in more particular, but for now, just know that those are the main texts. They define the rules, the protocol by which customs must go, and by which you must go as well as a licensed customs broker. 
Uh, so this is basic. Uh, this is the basic platform, basic foundation, which is which is expected. One is expected to know to be considered a licensed professional. So this is the core. And uh, this core, customs examiners did provide us with this core, uh, and we have harmonized tariff schedule. So le let's look at the harmonized tariff schedule. We have harmonized tariff schedule, which is the basic edition. If you download, if you click on that link and you download it, you'll see it's about four thousand pages. So four thousand pages. That means about. 2,000 sheets, and this will become relevant as we'll see later on, because right now we are talking about organization. How should we organize this stuff? All right. Uh, the next item on the list that customs examiners provided is the Code of Federal Regulations. Remember those uh, little uh, tiny books that uh, we had on the screen uh, that uh, the the proctors or the examiner, the, the Pearson guys provided uh, as FYI what to expect when you get to the exam site. So my argument is uh, don't don't go get those small books because you need margins. And the way you get margins is by printing the stuff out on eight and a half by eleven paper. And then eight and a half by eleven paper can be printed out by providing the PDF file to the printing company or to your own printer. Here is the link. So we have April 2020 version. Uh, so the first one is from 0 to 140. Uh, that one has 950 pages. Uh, another one, if you click on the link, uh, from 141 to 199, uh, this is 755 pages. All right, so uh, all together, if uh, we go down to the recommendation, uh, we know that one inch uh, holds up, and we're talking about the binding equipment. Uh, it holds about uh, 250 sheets or 500 pages of double spaced. So we also know uh, from the text that we had 4,000 pages worth of, uh, approximately 4,000 pages, a little bit under, of the harmonized tariff schedule, and 850 sheets or just under 1,700 pages of the CFR. Mm -hmm. So there you go. You, you can uh, uh, use these numbers to figure out your strategy. Are you going to be using uh, the... Uh, the binding equipment such as the one uh, which is on, let me switch the screens for a second. All right, so I, are you going to be uh, using the equipment which is this one? Are you, or are you going to be using equipment which is this one? Because binding is a key and the organization. I... I'm not going to say which one you have to use here. I'm just going to tell you which one I feel most comfortable with. And uh, as you probably guessed, I feel more comfortable with this one uh, because uh, I just simply deal, dealt with it uh, ever since I was a student. I had binders. Uh, they're comfortable. They can be broken down. And if marked properly, they can be used with greater efficiency. But again, uh, this is there is no hard uh, and, and uh, bright rule for this. But if let's suppose you were to use this one, so if 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 you are using uh, uh, the HTSUS, you have 2,000 sheets, uh, which is about eight inches. Uh, so that means if you're going to use the binder, you're going to have to have two binders of four inch, but that's getting, cutting it close because the four inch binder, uh, let me, let me show you an example, uh, why you, 
need to get not 4 inch binder but the 5 inch binder. And this is important guys because if you get the wrong equipment it will t t take you more time to uh, get the stuff done. So this is an example. This is not the actual HTS but this is a 5 inch binder uh, which I use for uh, for, for, for a legal case I, I, I had. Uh, so, but uh, basically the idea is the same, the HTS-US. So notice here, uh, once you open it up, if you are cutting it close, so this is a five, five inch, so if it was a four inch, it would be uh, cut very close. It's very difficult to flip the pages uh, because it's cut to the top. That's number one. Number two, if you're going to use inserts, uh, for example, you're going to use uh, annotations, so you break down the HTS-US into, let's say, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, etc. You're going to use uh, stuff. So in this case, I use Manila folder, which I cut up and hole punched. This is extra space. So yes, technically you do have Eight, about eight inches of space which you can fit in but uh, in reality you're going to need more so two five inch binders for HTS US if you're going to use the binding option now code, code of federal and it's also important to keep in mind that one must have definite number of binders in order not to be confused. To me, the perfect number is two binders for the HTS-US uh, and uh, two binders for the Code of Federal Regulations. So Code of Federal Regulations, we have 850 sheets uh, and uh, that is about 3.4 inches, uh, which means that two Two inch binders will do. However, that's uh, the same. The same principle is here. Don't go for the the, the very bare bone stuff, but uh, get yourself some extra space. So, in 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 the case of the code of federal regulations, this is an example of the three inch binder. I like to use the D-ring stuff because the D-ring stuff um, they're easier to flip. So I would use the three inch binder, two of them for the code of federal regulations. So that's it. You have two five inch, five inch binders uh, for the CFO, uh, for the HTS, I'm sorry, and two, the uh, uh, three inch binders for the code of federal regulations. Now, notice uh, this is not all because you also have the the informational stuff 7501 directive and you have the entry summary uh, the, the links that will be on the exam they are provided over here uh, but the bottom line is that this stuff take about well the entry summary is like 120 or 130 pages uh, but uh, since they, they tell you you're going to be tested on the first uh, 12 sections, it's really first 58 pages. Plus, you have 25 pages for the entry summary, plus you have the right to make entry directive. So give or take, you have uh, 100, let's round it up, 100 pages, uh, which would be equivalent of 50 sheets, double-sided. So you just get yourself, the 50 sheets can fit in into the small uh, point uh, five inch binder one inch binder let's say uh, the, the small tiny one so 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 that will be good so altogether you have five items five binding equipments uh, which you can use as a starting point very important uh, so you have you have the tabs uh, so what I like to use, as, as far as tabs are concerned, 
and as, as far as marking is concerned, uh, they are relatively, because they're relatively cheap and I mark them all the time because, uh, let's say, I need to submit a bunch of stuff to, um, to, to, let's say, to the court or to customs or to the other agencies. I usually mark it up and send it over. Um, even though we live in electronic world, we still uh, move stuff by paper a lot. So I use Avery tabs. Um, let me. So this is what they look like. Uh, it's just uh, one package with eight inches uh, of. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, eight tabs, and then eight tabs start over over, and you can mark them up. Very convenient. Uh, and uh, have been working for me so far. So in this case, you pull, you can pull out one tab and just say, okay, HTS US Chapter One, for example. If you uh, want to uh, annotate it, you annotate it. If you uh, annotate it so much that you need to change it, you just pull one out and put one, uh, put one in. Very convenient. So uh, this stuff, and I haven't written it out or anything, but let me. Uh, Put it, put it in the comments so you guys have an idea of what I'm talking about. And I buy the stuff, I think, of Amazon. Uh, so it's eight white tabs, 24 sets. Uh, so a Avery VT, model VT213-8. dash 11 by 8 and a half so so uh i just uh sent sent out the description to everyone so that way oh there is another thing it's the U, the upc code is 300 i'm just gonna put it in it's not too time consuming so that's the upc code that i i used and uh, 6471, I think it's the Avery number. All right, folks. So, so uh, with this, uh, you can, at least from my vantage point, uh, once you have this stuff, uh, you can uh, start conquering uh, comfortably. And the key, th key phrase here is comfortably the world of uh, customs broker license examination. All right, now, uh, if you're going to take my recommendations and do get to print this stuff out, I've seen people uh, using their printer, which is fine. Uh, oh yeah, someone, uh, thank you, Alison, uh, for providing the link. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also use uh, not only Amazon, I sometimes use uh, other sites. What I usually do is, uh, to get the best bang for the buck, I go to the shopping, Google Shopping, and sometimes they have discounts at, at other stores. So I'm not the stock, st Amazon stock up, uh, but uh, basically uh, Amazon is a starting point, and then you can do the price comparison. So, so, uh, so that's my. Uh, negative spin for Amazon because they don't always have the best prices out there. All right. Uh, so uh, now going to uh, let me see. Let me see. Yes, the printing stuff. So again, no affiliation, uh, but uh, my oh, just before we even go to the printing stuff, it's extremely important. And this there was a very unfortunate incident going back a few years. So once you get your stuff, your stuff you can get if you go to the print shop. Let's say print shop in your local neighborhood or the online print shop. There are many of them out there. Uh, you will usually get the option of having the papers hole punched, right? Uh, so it, uh, it is usually done by the machine, but uh, at the time when uh, the, the local print shop, I won't name the name, but basically you get th three holes, right? 
and those holes have a diameter. And I did not know at the time, but there are two standards apparently of uh, uh, the hole size uh, which are being used uh, for the purposes of hole punching the stuff. So that particular shop had a size of, I think, five millimeters. A and that was just barely enough to fit stuff into the binder. And because of that, once, once, like imagine you have a bunch of pages. They are so tight together because they, they barely fit this ring that the moment you try to flip it and you're going to f want to flip it conveniently and flexibly because, remember, you are under time pressure, right? You are going to tear them to pieces or damage them or something like that. So uh, the hope, the whole puncher that I would s s suggest, the, the standard that I would suggest to be used is don't use five millimeter standard. So find out ahead of time or maybe get a sample to, from the seven millimeters or more. I think usually seven seven millimeters. So this, the the one I have for, as a standard is. Uh, the seven millimeter uh, in diameter of the hole punch, and if you have seven millimeters, I think you you will be comfortable with making sure the pages actually flip instead of getting stuck. It's it's a very minor thing, but once you make a once you make a purchase of uh, almost uh, how many like uh, three thousand sheets. Uh, you spend uh, substantial amount of money on this one, and uh, you f end up with a hole which is not the right size. Uh, that can be very upsetting. So uh, again, minor thing, but something I came across and something which I uh, would like you guys to stay away. All right, now, uh, so the print shop that I use, again, I have no affiliation with these guys, but so far, and again, like, like just like every print shop, they're not perfect. Sometimes, let me put them in. So, so those are the guys that I've been using uh, with decent results so uh, going to the HTS so let's what, what you're going to do is you make order so HTS US is uh, uh, well it's about 2,000 sheets right three thirty nine fifty five pages so if you go and uh, 39 55 divided by 2 so well Okay, let's round it, round it up to 2,000, okay? So you're going to want one copy, 2,000 pages, and let's call it HTS US. So, uh, and again, this guy say 2.7 for black and white copies. This is kind of uh, not perfect because they require you to make like 50 copies of one paper, of one or one order. So as you can see, you can you click on double-sided over here, and you get the cheapest uh, paper you can get, eight and a half by eleven. Don't worry about bleeding. So here uh, you have. Did I say two thousand? Yeah, two thousand is incorrect because that's sheets. We have 39.55 pages. So, uh, because you're going to get double-sided, one side counts as one. Here. Uh, so, that HTS, uh, they will print it out, and you may want to get a three-hole drill. So, those guys, remember my whole speech about uh, the holes uh, being the right size? Those guys uh, do the right size of holes. 
so they're good. I'm not speaking for uh, well, at least the last time I got stuff from them. Uh, so so speaking of uh, the the whole size, I with them I had positive experience on that end. Although sometimes they send me their own stuff. So one time I made an order and they sent me like a bunch of uh, uh, manuals for n- 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 training the nurses in New York City hospitals. Something which I didn't need and it was a packages and packages. I was like, what's, what's this? I, I, I need my custom stuff. And they're like, just hold on to that. We'll print you out another one. We'll send it out. Sorry about that. So I had all this paper to recycle. I was like, do you guys don't, you sure you guys don't want it? They're like, no, you can keep it. So I ended up utilizing this nice manuals for the copies. But basically, uh, uh, th- those those guys uh, uh, would charge you around two hundred dollars uh, for, and, and these guys are in New York too. So, uh, but they, they ship everywhere. If you're in New York, the the only uh, negative benefit of being in New York is they do charge you tax automatically, because you would be an user. If you're in New Jersey, they would not charge you tax. So. But again, this is this is uh, one example of print shop. You don't have to to use this one. Uh, it's just one example of the one w- with which I had a decent experience, and I thought it might be helpful uh, to share with you guys. So I have a go- uh, yeah. So uh, Ellison shipping. If you order over, uh, let me see. I think if you order more than certain amount, one. I think it's uh, one hundred. Let, let me proceed because uh, okay so the shipping itself is free if you are uh, I believe it oh yes yes free if you can see free ground shipping on orders over 125 so uh, if you have the HT, if you have the HTS book uh, then you're going to get your CFRs, which is $200 right there. That's already free shipping. So you can try them, see if it works out, and, and uh, then go with CFR or vice versa. But if it's as long as it's over 124, what they do is they send UPS ground. And UPS ground is usually pretty good. They send you the tracking number, and they print the stuff out real fast. So, um, so, 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 yeah, so... Uh, that's that's the paper weight so over 25 the weight of the paper so the weight of the paper uh, i i know that the weight of the paper is uh uh is is, is relevant because what, what these guys are using so i use so for my office uh, uh, i use the reams of paper i go to costco so uh uh, the ream, this is 500 sheets, it's 20 pounds. No, no, it's 75 grams per square meter, I'm sorry. 75 grams per square meter. So, um, the paper that they sent is very much akin to the paper uh, that I get from Costco for my office. So, it would be uh, 75 grams per square meter. Uh, approximately but they sometimes they use cheaper paper too uh, because uh, remember the the way these guys do is these guys may, make stuff on volume uh, and uh, uh, but whatever I just des- described as far as far as the uh, you, you know the uh, binding equipment is concerned obviously if you have a higher you know, thicker paper, you may not be able to fit so much stuff comfortably. But here, you need the stuff that's on the paper, not the paper itself. So, so, uh, so far I found these guys to be using acceptable quality of paper for the purposes of getting the information down. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I did have, uh, so, so I, I do know some individuals 
prefer to print stuff. And some of the individuals actually prefer to print stuff simply because uh, their companies subsidize the printing. So uh, I know it's COVID, so everyone, well, not everyone, but uh, uh, many folks, uh, they uh, do remote stuff. Uh, so if you, but if you travel to the office, you may have access to the printer, which you, you can use as a company printer. It can be used as a, like a fringe benefit type type of thing. So, um, so yeah, uh, this is uh, something which is uh, uh, you can use uh, because it is subsidized. Uh, but what I've done, what I did find out, if you are not subsidizing, uh, if your your company doesn't subsidize this stuff. Uh, it is possible that you may opt for your own printer. Keep in mind the cost of the toner, the cost of the, uh, well, you, I presume you use the, the laser. If you use inkjet, forget about it. Uh, the cost of the toner, you can go through uh, so th three toners or more easily, depending on the toners. And uh, it, you may be just better off just, getting the stuff from the print shop. So uh, not to say that you may not need to use a printer to fill in the blanks. Let's say you do the annotation and you want to change it later on. For that stuff, you may need a printer so you can stick that piece of paper in. All right, so uh, this is uh, my intro on uh, the material. Uh, so I see the question about the uh, calculator. So uh, let's for, for, for question on calculator. I think we need to go back to the uh, exam exa exam itself. So so I I'm done with this best value copy stuff. Let's 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 go to the page itself. So I tra traditionally traditionally. Uh, I was able to bring uh, this type of calculator in. Uh, it's a very basic calculator, and I kind of like. You, I'm still using it. Uh, it's it's just convenient because sometimes you just and you you'll see me uh, if we're going to talk about later on about valuation stuff uh, or the duty stuff. Uh, you just I'll just pull one out of the pocket or pick it up from the table and just type it in. Even though I have a, access to the computer and, and the phone, I still use these calculators. So, uh, so I'm just used to that. So, the but but but, but uh, going to the exam itself. So, please, uh, if if you're going to use Okay, if you so rules of agreement. Uh, so this is a the the testing site company which uh, uh, administers the customs license broker exam. And here's what they say. Take a look. Uh, they say that what's allowed and what's not allowed. And here they explicitly say that notes, notebooks, study guides, calculators, dictionaries, pens, and pencils are allowed in the testing room. So if you guys coming in and uh, the test administrator says, listen, uh, I can't allow you to use this very basic calculator. You pull this uh, rules of agreement, which you will need to sign before, before they let you in, so bring bring it with you. Highlight it and say, well, hey, listen, uh, guys, uh, according to your own rules of agreement, I am allowed to bring a calculator. Of course, it can be the the sophisticated calculator, right? Like, but back in the days, there was explicit statement: no scientific calculators. Now we have calculators on phones, smartwatches, etc. No. So that's that's not allowed. So, um, so, so uh, well, yeah. I think I said something about the scientific one. So, uh, 
I don't think mine is scientific. The one I use is Texas Instrument Simple Calculator. It's, uh, this is like 499 calculator. Uh, very basic. All right. Since we're on the rules of, uh, since we got to the uh, candidate rules of agreement, there are several more items that I would like to point out. Uh, and uh, uh, custom, so going to the paragraph number five, <clears throat> they do say that the paper and writing utensils for the paper will not be provided by the test center. And uh, this is important because they used to, back in the old days they used to give you the scratch paper not anymore so and the scratch paper and other stuff which we'll go over uh, shortly are extremely important uh, tool because simply think of the one scratch paper as another screen that you can use in addition to whatever screen you provided. Uh, from the picture we saw earlier custom examiners do say that you get one screen um, and that screen was not uh, like 4K uh, wide screen. It, it was just one of those uh, cheap screens that that uh, I, I don't know where you can buy them. Maybe anyway. So uh, uh, I think uh, it's important to bring a lot of scratch paper. How much scratch paper? You will know that. Uh, you, you you will know that you will be able to have the approximation of how much scratch paper by through the practice. Uh, but uh, keep in mind on that volume, right? They want you your volume to be limited to uh, that uh, 16 by 16 by 16, something like that. So I have that that uh, standard 15-inch office ruler. So uh, just picture the volume that you can fit within this ruler and that would be a good approximation. Although I don't think there will be too too much enforcement on this volume. I, I, I just they just don't want people showing up with uh, bags and bags and bags of uh, uh, material which they will not have time to use anyway. So uh, another uh, in another provision uh, that I wanted to bring your attention to is paragraph eight. Uh, and my, I may, I may be wrong, but back in the, back in the day when I took the exam, they did allow some snacks. I may be confusing it with a bar exam because uh, I took a, a customs broker license exam back in uh, 2004, no 2005. Uh, the bar exam I took in 2011. Uh, so I may be, but they did at one of those exam sites, and bar exam is much more like, kind of like a rigorous type because uh, they all all over the stuff, not just customs. Uh, so they did allow to, of course, you can't bring a cheeseburger, but if because it's just item that causes other people to crave, I suppose, and. It's, they call it smelly items. But if you, if you it, there used to be a day when you bring like a light snack, maybe like, uh, you know, like a trail mix or something. Uh, you, you could do that because a lot of people, uh, you may have noticed when you're going through a lot of hardcore thinking, brainstorming of ideas, you always want to, you, 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 your arm always, is, or your head is always thinking about snacking on something, putting stuff in the item. If you notice, uh, I'm not doing too much hardcore thinking right now, but uh, basically what I'm doing is uh, I am sipping on coffee uh, because uh, uh, it's, it's just something which just which is helpful. So so they do have, uh, uh, they, they did change that, so um, I, I don't think they allow snacks. Of course, if you're I think if you can, if you can show that you are diabetic, you can qualify for reasonable accommodation, because to keep your blood sh blood sugar level, you need to have uh, food intake. Uh, but that's a different story. 
All right, so so uh, no snacks. Uh, another point uh, which is part of the agreement that I wanted to cover and we're on the next page, uh, it's an NDA agreement. Uh, Non-disclosure agreement here uh, is, uh, I, I think, uh, it's limited in time. In other, in other words, it doesn't mean that you're absolutely not allowed uh, to discuss this, but let's say uh, you are going into for a bathroom break and you encounter someone. Uh, this is what they don't want to discuss. For the first time, to my knowledge, customs broker examiners administered two exams uh, during October. So they, uh, one of the concerns was the a. So the one was AM and the one was PM. So they said, okay, AM people cannot discuss this for 24 hours uh, with PM people, even though the PM and AM exams they were completely different exams. In fact. October 2020 exam was uh, the version for the missed April 2020 exam, which was never administered because of the COVID crisis. So uh, this is what uh, uh, they, they, they want you to uh, take. So unscheduled breaks, restroom, uh, I would say one should incorporate at least one break uh, maybe five minutes to run into the restroom uh, as a part of the strategy, test taking strategy, uh, because simply uh, trying to force it through if you need if you need to use the restroom is uh, is a torture. <laughs> so don't do that to yourself. All right. Uh, so. Uh, I think this is important point too, uh, paragraph 12. So remember that the customs examiners, they limit you on volume of what the stuff you can bring, but let's say they limit you on volume, you leave stuff outside, uh, you can access it later on. So like one of the extra items which I find useful is the dictionary uh, because uh, throughout the test, you'll be encountering, as, as you practice, you'll be encountering a lot of words, uh, which the meaning which you, you never heard before. And uh, you may want to look it up, and uh, this may be helpful. So dictionary can be helpful. Of course, dictionary, uh, if you're using the pocket edition or you're using the regular version, it, it can be in volumes, right? So uh, I haven't seen that, but customs may limit you on the stuff that you can bring, so you can flag that question for later and use it. Here. So it's just an option, not 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 the one that you will likely to take um, to avail yourself of, because from from what I heard and seen, uh, that usually you can bring. A lot of materials in, but uh, nevertheless, if you are arguing about your rights, um, your rights are critical to your success. So you want to avail yourself of every option which is in your, to your advantage. All right. So we'll talk. We'll be talking about uh, when uh, you finish you raise your hand but keep this in mind after the last candidate completes the exam you may leave the testing room so if you finished early you might you just might find yourself in a situation where you want to double check your answers since you won't be allowed to leave anyway uh, yeah I even even during the old days, they kept everyone in the room. They didn't allow people to leave until uh, your time was up. So if you have extra time, which you shouldn't, because every minute should should be spent, uh, even if, if, if you're done with, it, with the exam, you still need to double check the other answers. 
and there is a method uh, to that which we'll talk about in a bit but uh, uh, this is something which you must know so don't end your exam because uh, earlier earlier than everyone else because um, you, you you'll be sitting there doing nothing uh, where while you could spend your valuable time on double checking your work and there is a, there is always stuff to double check all right so uh, that's that goes to the uh, the rules of agreement stuff uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the main items that I wanted to go over so the next on the list is the exam itself okay so sample customs license broker examination where it can be found so you you go to that uh, let me put it in the uh, chat screen so you go to that uh, Pearson sample examination page and perhaps the, this this sample examination page is the most critical piece of today's lecture because this is something that you guys must familiarize yourself with uh, very well so uh, there will be miscellaneous provisions there will be other provisions which are substantive but I just wanted to bring your attention uh, to how it looks so you have several buttons and exam next uh, you should know the directions they repeat themselves from time to, uh, from 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 one exam to another so you should be familiar with this stuff non-disclosure agreement remember the one uh, we talked about in the uh, the CBLE candidate rules of agreement it's still there so don't spend uh, too much time reading it although this if you can see at the top right corner uh, this is not the type of stuff which is counted against your 4.5 hours and I think uh, I had to have well we'll cover it later but well why, why don't we cover it now so let's go to the introduction outline and look at the time all right so here is the time so we have 4.5 hours which is pretty good because back in the day when I took mine you, you only had four hours to complete uh, same amount of questions 80 questions if you even rewind to the late 90s early 2000s some of those older ones older exams in the late 90s they had 100 questions and they had four hours so so literally speaking you guys are in good shape compared to your predecessors and you have more information available at your fingertips thanks to the modern information technology so but nevertheless it doesn't mean that you you get a lot of slack because you the exam is still the time management so you have three minutes so basically you have 275 minutes or 4.5 hours on average this means you get three minutes 22 seconds I think it's rounded up uh, per question on average of course uh, you will not be able to uh, average this out for every question but you should say as you practice you should you guys should have some kind of clo internal clock to be able to time yourself uh, based on the, on, the, on the question list and of course you should be able to leave yourself a time buffer I did talk about the bathroom breaks for example uh, we there may be some time checking breaks because sometimes you come across the question you just don't know what that it's basic question like uh, what CBP form uh, must be used for this and this purpose and you just stuck you, you do not know where to look at it you just have no idea what that regulation is so what uh, and you don't want to spend too much time looking for it so you move on 
going to the stuff you know because if you don't get uh, to the stuff you actually know that will be uh, that, that that will not be good so you want to cover the stuff you know the stuff you need more research on you leave uh, for later and you go back to them right so so in this situation there should always be some kind of buffer so my goal my, my recommended goal is uh, for everyone to spend three minutes uh, per question on average. 75% uh, is a passing score, so it's it's not like you get an A or a B like like in school, uh, but uh, you uh, need 75% means out of 80. This means that you get 60 questions. Correct, right? So. You can make mistake on 20 questions and still pass, uh, but uh, the idea is to answer all of the questions because uh, if you skip the question, it will be counted against you. So if you come against a time crunch, you just don't know the answer, period, guess. If you come to the uh, uh, exam and uh, you uh, come across the questions where question where you see more than one answer, and those do happen. Uh, if you have more time, I uh, refer you back to my appeal uh, lectures, uh, which I publish on the, on the main body of lowcustoms.com. But um, you do have more. You quite. You do have more than one one answer. Quite a lot. So the the idea is this proverbial single best answer rule. Why is it what, what customs examiners consider the best answer is not necessarily what customs, what you yourself may consider a best answer. So the only way to kind of get uh, acquainted what to, and get a feel of what customs examiners feel the best answer is, uh, is uh, uh, your ability to to, to, to gain to get to, to gain a sense of it through practice so it's not an exact science you kind of have to go through so many customs uh, broker license exams as, as by way of practice to kind of get a feel for that but those don't come too often because they they do uh, they, they 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 do happen maybe Maybe up to five questions per exam. Other other answers can be straightforward. So they they don't make or break if if you are solid on other material. All right. Uh, after you pass the exam, so uh, this is a forward-looking statement. This is what uh, the uh, modern-day customs broker license looks like with your hopefully with your uh, name on it. One of the things that I usually get uh, for for uh, qualification criteria, criteria is uh, this uh, third checkpoint. Uh, you must possess a good moral character. Uh, and uh, so I, I know that, that that good moral character stuff is very oblivious. Uh, what is good? What, what, who is considered to be a good moral character? In uh, the short answer is you have to understand that most of the customs transactions that you'll be dealing with uh, deal with money. So the question uh, is it comes to your ability to manage money and. Uh, uh, that that's important because uh, customs looks at it as if you are a financially responsible person, then you are trustworthy of getting a license. So it will be a pity for customs uh, for for you to go through all this time and efforts, pa pass the exam, and then customs says, "Hey, listen, you have a bankruptcy, so you're not." Uh, 
uh, you do not possess a good moral character. Of course, customs will not say that out flat, especially since 2008 financial crisis when uh, a lot of, I think, a uh, third of United States households uh, went through financial trouble and uh, which include b bankruptcy. Uh, the incomes were down. And this is not because they're responsible, it's really because of the economy, the way the economy behaved, and they just got cut in a whirlwind. So for good moral character stuff, uh, if you guys are thinking uh, or have your own doubts, as a part of the homework, I will assign, uh, I, I, I had a whole lecture back a few years ago about the good moral character within the, let me see. So, yes, right here. Uh, so, the chapter one, so those, those text, text, textbooks that I did provide, uh, and if I haven't provided to you, they are either in the mail or I'll be getting to you because you guys are going to get your electronic edition too, uh, the ebook version, in addition to the paper version. Okay, so this is what the book looks like, basically. And uh, the first chapter, the introduction, which is the focus of our lecture today, uh, sometimes not 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 every class but uh, back back in when like 2017 so that's that was like three or four years ago uh, I took time and just looked over examples and situations based on the record where customs did say you the person is not worthy of customs broker license exam uh, I mean customs broker license because in their judgment they did not possess good moral character. Uh, it was, so what I've done is I pulled the case law, uh, which was a matter of public record, and I just, just discussed circumstances of each. So uh, we had situations from uh, family members who are mafia. So uh, we had uh, uh, this uh, case uh, where we had a uh, relative of uh, John Gotti uh, which had no record criminal uh, or, or, or bad record whatsoever, but custom says, uh, the examiner says, okay, since you're related to that man, uh, you, are, you do not possess a good moral character, so uh, there was a core battle uh, on, on that grounds too. Uh, and uh, uh, then we had people with drinking problems. Uh, we had relatives who were dealing selling or dealing with drugs so so part part of your assignment uh, so don't worry about pre previous videos and perhaps I should be talking about this uh, book structure too uh, I think it's a good time to talk about this but uh, please keep in mind that each chapter of the book so so each each uh, so once you open it, uh, each chapter has a what's what's called a web supplement. Web supplement usually consists of lectures, uh, lectures which I've done in the past, lectures which I knew. So for example, this is a chapter one introduction update in a way for this book. Uh, at the same time as as, as it is a class, uh, but some of the stuff I don't cover simply because uh, it will uh, take more than. Uh, regular lecture time to cover because there is a lot of stuff to cover pretty much and uh, there is only so much you can do uh, so I'll be making an assignment and uh, making sure that you guys cover these topics by looking at the playbook playback uh, and uh, in this case uh, we have the assignment the good moral character so just uh, make sure that uh, uh, you guys watch this video so you guys are aware uh, of what uh, good moral character is. Uh, 
uh, from as a matter of record at least and if you have any questions after we can discuss this so uh, next 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 uh, we I usually have supplemental material uh, which sometimes goes beyond customs license broker exam because if I understand that you must focus on narrow issues of getting this thing passed the problem is is to get those get uh, get the, the, this narrow issue achieved, it helps to have a broader perspective. So if you have time, I will be providing literature, I will be providing various other recommendations which do not necessarily fit within this narrow rubric of customs broker license examination, but they do provide you with a broad overview and understanding of the uh, imp import procedures, international trade, how things fit in within uh, the world of rules and regulations. For example, uh, the meaning of the person is a term of art, but to understand the term of art, you have to know something about the corporate law. You have to know something about the creation of LLC, the legal fiction of corporation, uh, whether uh, what is uh, the presumption treatment of officers and what the officers are. This goes into the corporate law, which are presumed, with knowledge of which is presumed by the time you sit at the customs broker exam. So to really get to this concept of a legal person uh, or the natural person within the context of the customs broker exam, you kind of have to dig a little bit deeper. So sometimes I will be taking out this intellectual sh shovel and start uh, uh, digging stuff down uh, in a way which you may find wasteful. Uh, but uh, this is uh, my professional judgment. Sometimes I, I do this for the heck of it because I think it's fun. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, uh, take it or leave it. Uh, I, I'm here to provide recommendations. So, uh, that's, that's with respect to the supplemental material which are provided in addition to the books. Uh, we also have practice as exam questions uh, which are hand-picked uh, that you can see how customs examiners are testing on the stuff. Uh, this stuff are usually, pro depending on the topic, they will be more or less. I haven't updated those questions, so if you know that this book is 2017, um, I have some outline, and this is the reason why I have outlines too, because I update the stuff. But because by the time you publish the book, sometimes the law changes so much that you'll be like thinking, okay, maybe I should just wait for publication and just do that outline thing, uh, because uh, it's just it's just more easier and more relevant. Because um, I would I don't want you to waste your time on stuff which. Uh, I will not be tested and are not helpful within that larger scope of understanding rubric as well. All right, so that's uh, that's my take on practice exam questions. Uh, so I, I will so throughout the ex the class I'll, I'll also be updating because remember this is 2017, so we had about uh, one two two and a half years worth of exams so at least four exams that need to be incorporated into this material speaking of the exams the exam compilation they provided on a customs uh, broker website however you can also find them over here uh, so if you go to exam history compilations uh, there will be a links uh, to the exams dating all the way back to uh, uh, to the 1997. Wow. So, so that's uh, that's something which you can use as a resource. And uh, so the latest one, you can download, print, practice, and the answer choices. They pro they're com they're combined as one file in the at the back. What I wanted to show you is is the date. So, so, so customs examiners, when they provide answers, sometimes they change 
we have a change of uh, I want to say change of heart, but it's really change of mind because uh, the uh, the original answers are different from the answers which I provided at the beginning, and this is because of uh, the the this is a deliberative process, uh, and this, I suppose so. For for example, for October exam, they kept revising their answer sheet uh, as late as uh, November 18th, 2020, which was uh, just under two months ago. So, um, uh, so that, that's that's as far as exams are concerned. Now, uh, going to uh, back back to the outline and uh, going to the let me see. Yeah, so that's for that's for the good moral character. Now, uh, the book uh, also contains the chart and the outline contains the charts. What's very important uh, to know about these charts is the reason why they're there. So this is something new. This wasn't uh, before uh, this particular class. And this chart relates to the check sheet, which I recommend to implement and use it as a part of the practice and ultimately exam at the exam. So uh, here, here is the reason. So I, I received the phone call from uh, one of the uh, examinees who took the exam, which was online, but was very much certain that the answers she provided were not the answers that were taken by the system. In other words, there was a, some kind of systemic glitch. And my next question, my, my, my response was, all right, so are you sure about that? And the answer was, uh, yes, uh, uh, I'm sure there was the system did. I, I said for, for answer choice, let's say 20 and just, just hypothetically speaking, I said A, but the system put, put it in as B. I said, well, hold on a second. So I, I do know, I do know that there were system issues. Uh, before, because we live in the electronic world. So, for example, even today we had issues with uh, uh, audio sound, for example. Uh, and so, this is something which which is which is inescapable. But the question is, how do you correct it, and how do you know if there was a system issue, and how, moreover, how can you prove that? So, the ex the chart one, the uh, the examination question. Uh, questions check sheet I did put as a way for you to have establish a record independent record on paper that the answer choice you stated in the system on the customs license broker exam is the one that the system ultimately accepted and there were no there were no technical issues and even even that check sheet is is, is can be problematic because uh, if if in fact that did happen, it's really your word against the the uh, the the person administration administration right. So one way again I'm looking it from the perspective if you are in a courtroom. What would I do if I was an attorney, right, uh, representing that party? Uh, I, I would simply make that, put that person under oath uh, to, to uh, make an affidavit, which is uh, under the penalty of perjury, to, to say, this is my procedure during the customs broker license examination. What I do is I make answer choice. If I'm not sure, I make a check my check minus for example or if i'm not completely not sure i skip it altogether only to return to it later as time allows and after that if time allows i do return I, if i find a different answer i cross it out and i put in a different answer 
which is refl reflected on my examination question check sheet. And that procedure I apply in a standard manner every time I take uh, I, 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 I try to resolve a question. This is my standard procedure and according to my record, that record that customs examiners accepted does not match. So this is something, and since this, this is a standard operating procedure, it will be like standard business record, right? Uh, how do you prove that the mail went out, for example? Well, uh, uh, a lot of mail doesn't get the tracking number. So at least uh, in New York court system, the way you prove that the mail went out is you put forward the standard business practices that your establishment does in the regular course of business. So here in the regular course of taking customs license broker exam, I think uh, it's, it's a safe thing to do to make sure that uh, you stick to the procedure and uh, you uh, create your own independent record which you can keep which is independent of the system. So, so that's why I decided to put it in uh, just as a safety valve for um, for, uh, for for this uh, um, exam answer and deliberation. Now, of course, there is more to this than just a safety valve, right? Because if you uh, look at the exam, exam uh, examination question check sheet itself, and guys, uh, so I know this is a two hour lecture I'm over so so if you have to go I, I'm not going to keep you you can log in log out whatever uh, I am not the type of person who just sticks strictly to the timeline so I, this today I'm going to uh, I'm, go, I'm going to go a little bit over sometimes I go going to go a little bit under and since we have classes plan through March uh, yeah yes through, through March but we, we do have most of April available we may have extra classes out the idea is uh, to to be prepared so if, if it takes more then it takes more so I'll, I'll just I'll just gonna uh, uh, go over sorry all right uh, so we're Stuff that I think of that are very important here. So notice that the answer choice check minus and check plus. So this is my simply my suggested methodology because check plus is something that I'm very sure about. Sometimes I'm not so sure, maybe because it's a guess, but it's an educated guess. But this is something to be checked later on. I would I, I use check minus. And if this is something which I don't want to touch, uh, I'll just mark it as skipped to be returned later on. We are going to come back to the exam itself and see how this particular check sheet fits within the, uh, the, the electronic version of the exam. But for now, I think it's very important for you not only to develop a methodology to be able to go back, but also to understand that customs license broker exam is comprised of questions which have different levels of difficulty. And those different levels of difficulty are uh, also put in this check sheet too. So uh, the easiest, uh, again, this is, ki this is kind of subjective because sometimes it's... Uh, it's, it's a question of, are you either know it or don't, right? And if you don't, don't know it, then this, some, this is something which can take you a long time to find out. But uh, based on my experience, support, so assuming that you know this, assuming that you know which version of CFR to pull out, or assuming you know how to drill down, to funnel down to that particular question, uh, you, this is what my experience time-wise has been with the customs broker license exam questions. So uh, recall, go, recall going back to the very beginning of this uh, 
of this class, I said that we have the HTS and we have the Code of Federal Regulations as the core two items which will be tested. So those core items in turn, they do interact. And depending on their interaction, they, they generate questions of various difficulty. So now, if we go, if we go back to, uh, to, to, to my uh, little table out there, I'm reading comments. Okay, so okay, thank you guys <laughs> for not for not uh, throwing uh, rot rotten tomatoes at me for uh, going over time. <laughs> All right, so uh, let let me go back to this check sheet. So, uh, so from my experience, this has this is uh, what we have. We have non value so so number one. Uh, we have non-evaluation questions right there, uh, and non-FTA CFR. So we're talking about the Code of Federal Regulations, which is straight up, you either know it, or you don't, but you know how to look it up. I'm talking about stuff like, what is the CBP form number that you can use? Uh, what is, uh, how many days from the date of entry you have to do this to like to file a lawsuit in the international court of trade how many uh, uh, forms of particular uh, document you must use let's say to file a protest right this is kind of questions which just test your general knowledge on ability to be able to open up this code of federal regulations and answer it you know so this is easy stuff if you know this uh, this should take you less than half a minute so those stuff take less time the next uh, type of question which can be uh, which heightens the level of complexity is classification classification question they do involve deliberation and we'll be spending a lot of time on classification because uh some people decide to say all right the classification because many people think classification is most difficult part i think it's most fun part because simply there is no right or wrong answer uh, many times uh, there is a lot of gray area uh under the rubric of general rules of interpretation uh so uh you in that gray mushy 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 stuff right so the classification the classification is the next one because it, it it requires you to reason. It's not just your knowledge, but ability to apply facts to the particular situation. So uh, that's that's the next one. The next level of difficulty you have a combination of classification and valuation. So we're talking about uh, uh, custom designers can give you. A, f a form. Let's say they give you the CBP form 7501 and they leave some parts blanked out. And then they ask you, let's say, on country of origin or the harmonized tariff code. But to answer this, you have to know C Code of Federal Regulations or the directive uh, or the uh, form 7501 instructions. So you have to go to several sources, to the code HTSUS and to CFR. To, to 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 get this particular question or set of questions right so those should be left later because it would be a pity if you spend all your time on this stuff but you missed all the stuff uh, for, which are simple simply because you run out of time so the idea is by the time you get to the exam you should have a plan and the plan is easy question first more difficult question last so the idea is on and how how do you differentiate you differentiate it on degree of time it requires you to pass uh, to to get the answer if you run out totally time there is always you can always guess but at least you have a methodology you come in you do not use suggested 
customs broker license examiners method of question one, question two, question three, question five, and, and go on. No, uh, because I mean, you can, if, but, but I wouldn't recommend it uh, because it's not as time efficient strategy as you, you, you would otherwise have. So free trade agreement is another example because uh, the legal text for the free trade agreements is found in the harmonized tariff schedule of the United States and Code of Federal Regulations. So we're talking about uh, Part 10, for example, of CFR and uh, general note, uh, whatever, uh, in the HTSUS. This stuff usually deal with tariff shifting. So this stuff usually deal with uh, forms. And sometimes you kind of have a combination of two to get this answer correct. So, so that's extremely important too. The most difficult question as far as uh, timing is concerned, what in my experience is the valuation. Valuation is part of the Code of Federal Regulation, but it is a separate animal. Because uh, I think someone said about the calculator, uh, as, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Ellison, Ellison uh, uh, mentioned that as long as you have a calculator and you get your percentages right, but to really put that formula down to practice, you kind of have to, like in exchange rate scenario, for example, you uh, say, okay, so the invoice says it is so many, uh, uh, let's say, Swiss, Swiss francs, all right? Uh, the exchange rate is this. The product left Switzerland on this day to Rotterdam. From Rotterdam it left, it was uh, transloaded on a ship and uh, uh, before it uh, reached New York, where it was offloaded, it stopped in Spain. Uh, so what is the exchange rate? And uh, they give you a bunch of uh, extra information just to get you confused. To get through this forest of numbers and uh, forest of uh, information and to sort out what's relevant, what's not, it requires more time than, for example, what CBP form do you use in this case? All right, and you have like one one sentence question. So those I would usually leave for last uh, because they simply require more time. So so this is extremely important because this is your gateway to the time management. Again, I, I cannot get tired of uh, repeating that this exam is about the time management and time management uh, uh, if you get it right you'll be alright so let me see let's go uh, so, so this is a background right so let's let's go to the exam itself and see uh, how 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 uh, uh, of course, we're going to the practice exam, right? To see how we can apply it in semi. Oops, time expired. Oops, no, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> so yes, because we in this uh, test uh, setting, the time did not expire. So okay. So remember what I just talked about, right? Remember that uh, some items, uh, the CFR items, they are more appropriate than non-CFR items. So you get to this page directions. So notice, look at the uh, right hand corner. Uh, this stuff, uh, you already start, began timing, but that's fine. Spend some time on timing yourself, but make sure you, you do what I, I just suggested as far as getting to easier questions first then non easier questions. So under uh, under this uh, a, a hypothetical where uh, so 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 remember the check sheet, right? So we go from less time to the one that require more time and we want to address those that are require lesser time first simply because they require less time and we don't want to run out of time by skipping over the, uh, the 
the, the questions which are uh, that, that we can get to. All right. So, looking at this particular example. So, we have customs examiners suggesting that, okay, this is how it's going to go, right? So, we're going to have 80 questions. Uh, and those questions will be uh, four and a half hours. And this is the order of uh, uh, the order of uh, those questions. Based on the chart that I suggested, how are we going to uh, deal with this stuff? Well, very simple. We start with the pure Code of Federal Regulation first. And for now, I know if this, this is new to you guys, just get the general concepts and you will be able to identify them later on as, as, as you progress. But for now, just we are taking the bird's eye view. All right. So here we have broker compliance. This is pure CFR. It's you either you know it or don't. So obviously question one through nine, one through eight is going to be the first, right? Uh, then we have practical exercise. Practical exercise is that combination. So on that scale, questions from nine to six will, will require more time. So I'm going to put them for later. Nine, nine through 16, I'm sorry. Uh, we have anti-dumping uh, CVDs. So it's, I like anti-dumping duties because they're so effective in controlling the trade and they're so provocative. Uh, but basically, they're the creature of CFR. They're, they can be creature of HTS. We'll learn uh, later on because they're tied into the HTS number. But I think uh, you can... They're, they're not pure ones. So I, I'd say, okay, so let me deal with CVDs later. Plus, there's only two questions. So I'll get to them before pure ones because they can be combos. Entry, on the other hand, is pure CFR, right? It's uh, Title 19, 141 through 143, CV4 7501, straight stuff. So questions 20 to 29 are going to be my uh, on my first to-do list. Classification. Remember, classification requires more time. So classification would be right up the alley on the next to-do list. So I'm putting down classification over here. 30 through 44. Valuation. Remember, valuation is most difficult. So those five questions that they got, 45 through 50, will be last thing I do. Drawback. Well, that's CFR. That's so a question 5153 will be on the short list. In IPR, intellectual property rights, also CFR. Bonds, part 111, CFR. Again, this is, you don't have to know this. But this is what you, you, you get into work, the methodology. You sit at the exam and you already know what to do. FTAs, free trade agreements. Well, this is a combo, right? So the FTAs will go into the middle. Because they can involve HTSUS and Code of Federal Regulations. FPNF, fines and penalties, that's CFR. So this goes into the uh, to first first order, uh, first column. Uh, the FTZ. So here, just to cut 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 down the FTZs, also CFR marking is CFR power of attorney is CFR. So pretty much from 66 to 80 will be first. So now, 
that I have this written down on my scratch paper, I can go to that uh, uh, to that uh, uh, re reference outline over here and start marking. It's okay if you don't know, for example, question number 20 or 21. You mark it skipped and you can come back to it later. But at least now you have a time management strategy that you can use before you even sit at the examination. And that's very important. Okay. So now, let's go uh, back to the exam itself and uh, see how... Okay, so this is the exam itself. Let me see. So, so now you can skip through. Oh, I have not yet this guy. Okay, so five answers each. Okay, so, so with this particular sample exam, you guys should play a lot because you need to be familiar with the navigation. You can highlight, and uh, I know someone mentioned the calculator. Well, the calculator here is provided. That's why. Uh, so that's that's example of calculator. But the problem with the calculator, so examiners can say, "Hey, listen, uh, calculator is not allowed. You pull out your uh, signed form, say calculators are allowed." Um, depending on the personality of the examiner, they may or may not let you through. But at least you know that even if they don't let you through, you have the calculator right there. Te <laughs> Texas, I just noticed this, guys. Uh, it's electronic version of Texas Instrument TI 108. Wow. Okay. Uh, so, you have a calculator option. Uh, what? So, you guys can play with this yourselves, but what I think is extremely important is a navigation, right? Because by the time you guys are getting, so by the time you get to, to the exam itself, you already have your strategy set up. So you go to the navigation question and you can skip, for example, the uh, more difficult ones and you can head to, to those that are uh, easier ones to tackle, time-wise at least. So uh, in this in this scenario, going back to the uh, exam, let's say, uh, so, so we had, you can just, just give you an example how you can jump. So question 20, you can jump to question 20, you can say, whatever, absolute quota merchandise info. And, and again, those are just examples. So uh, uh, don't use those questions as, as a matter of, um, uh, of procedure, not a substance. So, so for, for example, here, This I would I would pick this one, and I click next. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, let's look at navigation how it is. So in your check sheet, you should be able to mark it. But uh, see over here, the navigator is kind of like a, a backup version. It says you just completed question 20, and as you jump from one question to another you will be able to tell uh, what's complete, what's incomplete. But again, what I, what I think is extremely important is for you guys to be able to use your own check sheet as a backup uh, of uh, seeing what's going on. So that's why I do recommend to use your own version 
uh, in addition to whatever is there. Uh, for just to to avoid uncertainties and to protect yourself as well, as well as to uh, have a procedure in place. All right. Uh, next one. Next uh, chart. So this is a chart that you guys, uh, sh all of you guys, should have gotten. So we have 80 questions. The next one is <coughs> the uh, chart on Code of Federal Regulations, Chart 2, which lists the again uh, my my subjective take of what's heavily tested or what's not. Uh, something that you should know versus uh, pay more attention versus less attention to. So bolder it is, uh, more attention you need to pay to it. And here is an example for, uh, of, of, of the question that custom designers ask. Uh, and chart 3 talks about the HTS, the harmonized tariff schedule. Why is this important? So those charts should be printed out and possibly reviewed and uh, ingrained into your memory. So you wake up in the middle of the night and you can say, oh, wow, okay, part 181 after, part 10, uh, miscellaneous free trade agreements, part 111, customs broker responsibilities, part 113, bonds. Uh, so, uh, or, you know, like, uh, general note 3, rates of duty, for example. So, you... So this is a basic stuff that is a starting point because one of the ideas for uh, uh, for being successful in a customs bro broker license exam is n not only to to have a re well developed ability to apply uh, fact pattern to the to, 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 to the regulation or the law, but also to know exactly where to go. And so, yes, uh, you do not have time to know that what note three is, a, if you to show up without no knowledge that note three deals with the rates of duty, or note two deals with the definition of customs territory of the United States. You do not have time for that. If you have a question about what is the customs territory of the United States, what you do is you say, all right. Even if you do not know, it includes uh, Puerto Rico, the 50 states, uh, and uh, District of Columbia, you uh, know at least what to look. You go, okay, that's general note too. How do you know that? Well, you print this stuff out, uh, and you review this. You either uh, create a manila folder, or you... Um, when I was preparing, for example, what helped me is I created a corner, and I just posted it on the wall, and uh, before I uh, have a morning coffee, I would uh, uh, just drink uh, coffee and just review those stuff. So I know I know how to associate particular part number to the um, to the uh, what is called the, the 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 name of the regu uh, reg of, of regulation. Side note: sometimes the names can be misleading but the starting point is to at least know uh, this uh, table of table of contents and this is why i would like you to start memorizing or well you don't i wouldn't torture yourself just review them on a regular basis like make make it a rule every day just review chart one and ch i'm sorry chart two and chart three I think uh, I see we have uh, just curious. Uh, uh, hold on a second. First question: the navigator is left. So, so I I I I really like it. So 162 seizure. Okay, I'm just curious what it is, and this goes to exactly to the point I was uh, that I was trying to make. So let's go to that uh, question, right? So, 
which part of the 19 CFR addresses the inspection search and seizure and you provided those numbers? This is one of the easy questions to answer because this is straightforward. You either know it or don't. So I see that uh, uh, Katya said uh, 162, but let's say you don't know it, right? So if you follow uh, uh, the recommendation and you have the chart 2, which lists the, the, the table of contents for the CFR, you do know that part 162 deals with inspection, search, and seizure. It doesn't deal with all inspection, search, and seizure because, for example, some of the stuff uh, are done under the intellectual property rights uh, um, part. But 162 is there. So let's go back to that exam. So inspection, search, and seizure. So you, if you've been reviewing this chart every day, then to answer this question correctly should take you less than five seconds because you simply just have it ingrained in your memory. So please uh, print out and review those charts. Uh, uh, on a regular basis. So uh, I have Joyce asking me, what's the one before that? So we're talking about the uh, absolute quota. So, all right. So, uh, let's see. So, absolute quota merchandise imported in excess of the admissible quantity must be disposed of. Uh, that's a statement of fact. Which of the following is, a, is not an approved method of disposal? Okay. So, this one, uh, I picked enter into the U.S. commerce. Well, if It's absolute quota. There, so first of all, you must uh, you must understand that you you have tariff rate quota number one and absolute rate quota. Those are the types. If it's absolute, that means uh, you reach the ceiling and you cannot go above it. That means you cannot go above it for what? For the purposes of the importation of the, into the United States commerce or making what aka consumption entry all right uh, can you place it in ftz yes uh, can you enter it into because because ftz is a legal fiction outside of customs territory of the united states now since we're in ftz's and remember i did mention that uh, we're going to talk about uh, miscellaneous stuff which i rec highly recommend Okay, so I'm putting down this link. Uh, this is a lobbying body. Okay. Uh, and uh, th this guy, I'm not uh, affiliated with guys or anything, but I did attend some of their classes for just to see how they present the material. Uh, and here, uh, they next week will they'll be running a series of free webinars and they do quite go quite well into the meaning and the use of the foreign trade zones uh, some of the stuff will be useful as a foundation to understand foreign trade zones because foreign trade zones uh, is uh, not always but they're frequently tested on a customs uh, broker license exam so uh, either directly or indirectly. So in that previous uh, answer choice, which was w w one one to pick, or I mean, uh, sorry, one not to pick, uh, would uh, uh, be something which is indirect. Sometimes you have a direct question, like to apply for FTZ, what form you must fill out. So those guys are very good about doing this. So keep in mind, uh, if uh, you have opened schedule uh, from January 12th to 13th from 1 to 3.30 p.m., uh, register for their webinars. They're free and they're very useful towards the development of how the for what role foreign trade zones play in the United States uh, and how they're being applied in the world of customs. Customs regulations, they are very cut and dry. I try to spice them up sometimes, but with respect to FTZs, those guys uh, give real examples 
and uh, they're very good. So again, if you if you have, uh, if you can, uh, please register for them. The link provided. All right. So let me see. The Oh, so uh, go, 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 going back to our uh, uh, question on the on the exam, right? So can you sell it? So question is sell it how? So FTZ is considered outside of customs territory, right? So FTZ is an approved method. You're looking for one which is not approved. Enter at a warehouse, you know, uh, presuming it's a customs bonded warehouse, it's also this legal fiction, right? So uh, uh, it is an approved method because it's technically outside of customs territory. Uh, exported, so if it never imported, you can do the trans ex uh, transportation exportation entry uh, without ever having it uh, into the entering into the customs territory of the United States. So that's an approved tool. Destruction is under custom supervision, of course, is another uh, option because it technically never enters commerce. So the key question is, is this one. And since we are looking for the one that is not, uh, the C is the correct answer choice in this one. Uh, but uh, having gone through this, uh, this, do, th this is a little bit uh, about uh, be beyond uh, the scope of today's lecture because uh, today I wanted to cover the basics and the methodology of answering the customs license uh, broker exam questions uh, is subject to other lectures. All right, so uh, what's uh, so this is pretty much all I wanted to cover today. I can see that employee didn't the social security number. So Joyce, what question is that? Social security. Oh, you okay, this is the, I don't remember the one before that. So if you wanna tell me the, that question, but we can go over it. Um, yeah, it will help to know the, the, the question. But you know, you you'll be going through so many of them uh, that it's really not important to uh, for, for for today at least to get stuck up on any particular one. Uh, for the idea is to cover the procedure. Okay. So so yes. Uh, uh, this, this is a customs broker responsibilities one. What's not required for new employees? There is time time requirement. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you have to do the reporting uh, once you get someone on board within 10 days after passage of like 30 days, something like that. Uh, it's part 111 section 30 something, I think. I don't have it in front of me, but that's not for now, guys. That's not important. The important part is get the general procedure down, have uh, the understanding that the, there should be a method before you sit the exam to manage your time effect effectively and ability to feel comfortable uh, using your own material and ability to be able to use, uh, 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 to, be, to be a librarian, basically. So, so th those, those are the things. I uh, think uh, we can wrap it up for today. So, the, what, so again, I'll be sending, uh, I'll be sending out uh, and reaching out to those folks who haven't gotten the stuff, uh, sh their, uh, request for information. So uh, I use Google platform for the ebook. So those who are, don't have ebooks, uh, I mean, Google account, I'll be asking for Google account. Um, the, 
the homework so I, I already mentioned that you guys need to read about or the watch the video about the customs broker responsibilities uh, the, I'm sorry the good moral character I'll be sending out the stuff that you should uh, uh, be familiar with by the next week uh, and uh, in the meantime also you, you must understand that the well it does help f for me to come out and provide the overview of what I think is important in, in, in a what I think is a meaningful way in, in by way of this particular format. Uh, also, please understand that uh, as, as, as you go through the stuff, you have questions. No question is uh, a simple or not so relevant question. I am here to make sure that you guys feel comfortable with whatever question it is. So don't be shy to reach out to me by mail, uh, by phone number. And uh, what's the phrase goes? Use, use and abuse me, right? <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, so the recommended material I did provide, if you guys need, need, need me to, to help you out with PDF downloads and uh, getting these orders through, uh, give me a call or send me the email. I'll help you out on that as well. Uh, so, so if, if something that I did cover is not is not good enough, uh, use 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 my phone number, use my email, reach out. <laughs>